one of the 25th. Mm -hmm. And we're doing for the counseling services and we'll be doing it for the um, there's uh, cultural considerations of that. Okay. So. Oh, well, that, that thing that happens every year? Kind of as a disability awareness fair kind of? I guess. So, oh, that's, that's really good. It, it might be a different group. Okay. It, but it's on you and are not at Tim CG? I'm pretty sure. Okay. Well, Jerry's on the stick and, and Mark, Mark's got one uh, this weekend at, at Gen Gen Genoa, right? We're going to Genoa. Genoa, yeah, yeah. yeah. With the fire station in Genoa. Oh, no, Genoa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Oh, so God, this stuff is going. And Mark has been spearheading it. And I think Linda Porzig and, and, and uh, guys of Donna and, uh, and, uh, and Mark are doing a peer-to-peer -peer class twice a week. How, how, you know, strong. Two hours in Carson City on Tuesdays and Thursdays, right? Yeah. Oh, that's, wow, that's a lot of, lot of stuff. That's great. Huh? And, and your class is holding pretty good, 7, 8, 9. Seven. Seven, that's good, yeah. So, when, and uh, you know, they, they haven't kicked me out of the Dean Townsend as yet. I'm, uh, I'm uh, more, mostly in the Peer Resource Center now. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you, to buy an update for, we'll lead in, you know, Teresa, because uh, you, I don't know whether you know this or not. I, in fact, I'm not sure I understand it myself, but our, our, um, our POU, well, it used to be POU, Psychiatric Observation Unit, <clears throat> it changed to the, to the, uh, uh, the Rapid Stabilization Unit, and now I think we're able to bill for more Medicaid services, so it's going to be an intensive services. And it used to be called outpatient, the woman told me today, the, the psychologist that heads it up, Michelle Burke, she said today that, that now it's um, an, um, an inpatient unit. I mean, it's part of the inpatient. It used to be outpatient. So it's, it's only 10 beds. And, and, and you know, Teresa, you probably have heard this stuff already. You know, we, it's, it's hard to lead in with this. But, um, you know, we're starting to do what Las Vegas had. We're starting to be backed up in the emergency rooms you know, with people with psychiatric illnesses that need a bed and there's no bed. So, you know, yeah, it's, and, and then I hear people who go to West Hills and stuff and they just let them out after two days, or, you know, so. But Teresa, you, you, can you, you want to come? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is all stuff that, you know, that, that resources. You know. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me to come this evening. Thank you for the wonderful dinner. I think that was probably one of the best burritos oh, yeah. I've had in a while. That was the, the highlight of my day, that, that burrito and being here this evening. I'm Teresa Benitez Thompson, and I'm an assembly woman. I represent Old Northwest Reno, New Northwest Reno. And then if you live in Panther Valley, Sun Valley, or Golden Valley, then you all live in districts where where I would represent you. Is that 34, 24? Uh, 27, 27. 27. Uh, and I believe I knocked on your door oh, the, yes, during the, I, yeah. I, 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 I walked in, I was like, I remember I had a constituent who talked to me at the door about the importance of NAMI. And there you are, there you are right there. So. So a couple different things. Um, there's some real promising stuff that could be potentially happening in Nevada if we can get the money to do it. So what's going to be happening this upcoming legislative session, and you might have been hearing about it in the news, is the governor has proposed a budget that has lots of really good reforms for mental health and lots of money to support some good mental health. Um, I, I don't want to say reforms because nothing too dramatic is changing except that there's a big potential increase in funding, which will change things because you folks know better than anyone else that the wait for services and lack of services and being denied services is just about the most frustrating thing in the world. And so hopefully if we can get some some taxes passed then we're going to really be where we need to be on a lot of the different service areas um, one of the examples is the proposal for an increase in 70 million dollars for autism treatment and support 
um, that will make a big uh, a big difference for our parents. There's a it won't get rid of the waiting list for people who need services, but it will bring down the waiting list substantially. In in terms of I was making some notes and uh, other suggestions and things that were talked about was um, there's been changing changing in the way that Medicaid is reimbursed for certain services and we've been able to make it so that a lot of uh, inpatient services can now be reimbursed through through Medicaid so that's going to be um, it's already making a difference in the number of beds that are available both up here in northern Nevada and the number of beds that are available down in southern Nevada. Um, they've reopened in southern Nevada in September. Stein Hospital is going to be reopening. Um, it was a, a, a facility that they built, an inpatient facility. They built it, then they said, well, we don't have the money to run it. So it's been what we call kind of a mothball status. It's been sitting around empty for years. And because of the, the lawsuit with San Francisco, um, we finally realized we need to put money into mental health services. So they are bringing that facility up to par and it's gonna be ready and open in September of 2015. And it adds, I wanna say, and I might be correct, but if I remember correctly, about 40 beds down there inpatient. And then there's gonna be changes um, at Lakes Crossing Stein, Hospital is going to make it so that Southern Nevada doesn't have to fly people up to Northern Nevada for services, which means that there's going to be more access for those who need it up here in Northern Nevada because we don't have the congestion coming from Southern Nevada. So that will be nice because as far as Lakes Crossing is concerned, there's more beds available. Um, I'm actually uh, carrying a bill specific um, uh, to to the, the problem that was talked about with emergency rooms and um, people get put on you know the legal 2000s, um, they go into the emergency room and then you can't be discharged from the hospital until a doctor signs off that, that you're, you're stable and no longer a threat to yourself or others. But lots of times doctors can be uncomfortable doing that or the doctors just aren't available. Who's available in the morning is different than the physician that was on last night and the physician that admitted you is different than the discharging physician and they are always comfortable. So I've been working with, uh, over the past year and a half with quite a bit, a number of folks and we're, I've got a bill that proposes to um, uh, make it so that more clinical professionals can do that um, decertification um, for someone who needs a, a, a a psychiatric cold in a hospital so opening it up to um, nurses and, and and social workers who work in that clinical setting um, you probably have more interaction with those folks anyway than the actual doctor so they, they can get feedback and they can help uh, make that determination about whether or not you have to stay held in an emergency room because we know that's not the best place. We know the most important thing is getting people into wraparound services and there's money for that this session, hopefully. There's gonna be money for folks who, um, especially around transitional housing, but wraparound services to help um, with, uh, let's see, the housing component and also with um, clinical support services, increased outpatient services, increased, increased inpatient services. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that if we can get uh, a tax package passed, that we'll be able to, to fund some of these really good ideas that we know are important and that we know are necessary. I wanted to make sure that I heard from you folks about what your individual concerns were. For the past year and a half, the governor has had this council to address mental health concerns in in the state of Nevada, and it's been a lot of really high up people, administrators and department heads talking about what they think the change would be. But I don't know if, if throughout the course of that conversation they ever came to groups like yours to say, well, you know, what are your thoughts about this? And I don't think it's too late to have that conversation. So if you have specific thoughts about problems that you have, um, 
uh, barriers that you frequently run into, um, please do share them with me. I'd, I'd love to hear about them because they are things that I very much would hope we could get addressed this upcoming session. Uh, you know, you mentioned the, the there are, backlog in the there are some, uh, uh, medication. Medications? Yeah. yeah uh, what? Uh, yeah, that, uh, I, I, I went into my doctor, uh, my psychiatrist yesterday, I mean, extreme symptoms. Okay. And they um, uh, wanted to hospitalize me, possibly, but they want, but they said that they were going to try um, uh, giving me antipsychotics and tranquilizers, sending me home uh, with phone numbers and uh, called my son and everybody, like, talked to him. And, uh, thing so I went home uh, and uh, went directly to the pharmacy. Got there about ten to five, um, and the pharmacist said, "Sorry, two to ten days to get the antipsychotic okay." Two days for him to get. Uh, two days for him to give it to me. So I called the psychiatrist two back. Two to five. Or two to five, whatever they, the, the 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 pharmacist said. Two days to, 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 to you, you need a prior authorization. I get it. Mm -hmm. We have a prior authorization uh, request. The doctor has a right. So the doctor does writes the script for it, and it then starts the authorization request. But you can't get the script filled until the authorization and request comes through. And that's their Medicaid. It's a yeah. new, yeah, it's a new medication. It was. It, uh, we discussed all the medications. When I was in his office, and that this would be the best one for me because of like certain physical things that I have. It's a newer medication, so it's supposed to be like good, but it's probably more expensive. And uh, like the pharmacist said, they're not going to get kickbacks on that. They're uh, they're not going to get a, a lower price on that. It's a new one. It's one of the really good new ones. Just so you can have to wait. Yeah, what's it? What's it? So, so it doesn't have a generic equivalent yet. It's too new. No, it's too new. No. And yeah, what was that? All the antipsychotics do not have generics. So, maybe some. Of them. But there. And this was specific to one specific one specific man or your whole. No, just one specific man in Vega. In Vega. And um, what was I going to say? Uh, uh, so they gave me the, the, the tranquilizer. Today I went over there and they gave me samples because um, I, I, I personally am not going to the hospital. Yeah, don't. It's not, not where the right kind of care will happen. And, and, and then in this class, we do some of our peer to peer class, we talk about. You do. When you really want to avoid the hospital stay, there's things you can do to be safe at home, you know, and take care of yourself. But I had no idea that they were, you know, nor did the doctor, that they were just going to say, no. Let me, I'll ask, and do you have, are you in any kind of a managed care plan through Medicaid? Like, did they call Medicaid or was it going through? No, through Medicaid. Through Medicaid, okay, in Vega. I'm going to, I'll ask him about that. I'll ask him. Tomorrow, what the holdup is with that? In crisis situation. Yeah. And uh, to Mojave, but not to the, the state hospital, but to the state hospital. They probably they probably wouldn't give me a day for that. And um, uh, uh, but I, I did see you know a psychiatrist and um, uh, said you know okay this is crisis we're going to be home alone manually we're you know and. I went directly, maybe you promised to go directly to the pharmacy, you know, and take this and it will knock you out for 12 hours until you get used to Oh no, <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> you know, what you're talking about is so interesting because with the um, Affordable Care Act changes and now that we're covering um, childless adults. Um, the um, and and so now we have a new population that's on this before. Okay. Now, as uh, that we have that cohort in place, so we've got a lot of people on in Medicaid that we didn't have before, and the, and a lot of those folks have gone into managed care, uh, managed care groups. So, a mayor group, I think, has a lot of folks up here. Um, 
and suddenly it's woken a lot of people up because the managed care groups have been paid to help take care of the childless adults. So this is where mostly we think of our mental health population where they couldn't get coverage before because they were not old enough for Medicare. You know, you're in 30s, 40s, or 50s, and you don't have kids, so you weren't qualifying for Medicaid. So we had this change in law, and suddenly adults can get help. Um, and now there's these systems of care that have to be responsive to them. And I got a call from a lobbyist with one of the healthcare agencies that said, this is so much harder than we, we thought. We just, we didn't know what all was involved. And I said, what, what do you mean? And she to was talking specifically about um, a case she had to get involved with an, an adult woman about how the adult woman was in and out of the hospitals, had psychiatric issues, and then got admitted to um, one of the skilled nursing facilities when she got out of the hospital. And then they wanted to discharge her, but she had no place to live. And she's like, so they wouldn't let us discharge her. But how are we supposed to get her a place to live? And I was like, yeah, welcome to our world, right? I'm a social worker by profession. I worked for child welfare for five years, and now I work in hospice. And a lot of the people I work with um, are are people who uh, don't, you know, are very much not fixed income, and I have a couple folks who, who have been homeless, or they call themselves street people, and yeah, you get into a big problem when there's not a really good support net, and families and individuals have been struggling with this for a long time, and the formal health care establishment, the bigger health care establishment, I think is just finally to waking up to how much support is needed to really take care of individuals who who have a mental health diagnoses because there's not an easy answer there's it's not like any other disease where you know you've got a defined course of treatment and hopefully the end of the disease it's you know they didn't get that this was chronic okay i mean for as simple as that sounds they had no idea that they when you think about mental health stuff, we're talking about chronic lifelong conditions. And they, and to me, the, the things that they say and these moments that they've had of awareness, just I, I go, yep, yeah, I'm really glad you know that. Now what are we gonna do about it? Yep, it's really hard, you get that now. Now what are we gonna do about it? So I feel like we're gonna get hopefully some better, some better policy because you know, people in fancy three-piece suits are finally understanding what we're saying. <laughs> um, but what what else? Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, okay, my name's Donna Nijway. I used to work as a psychiatric nurse and dance in a giant years ago, and I also had the Adam Center for Mental Health Services. And I would love to see more than anything else is more job programs. I've always struck with that. Kids growing up, yeah. And also, um, you have handicapped adults, you're blind, you're deaf, whatever, that kind of thing. Those kind of issues are recognized in the workplace with special needs and all kind of laws that help people and stuff. And there are mentally ill adults who really would like to work. Some don't, but a lot do. And they have special needs too. You know, like my son. He's a hard worker, but they have special needs. They can't just be put into a workplace with other people. And if you, you know, if you've never lived with mental illness, you don't understand your needs. And I, I wish, I, I wish you would want to do a more job. But when I worked in dance, I was so frustrated the whole time. It's like, you, you know, with that, the clients who could get on Medicaid, uh, and we get them all set up, you know, the social worker would get them set up with apartments and, uh, and they get their Medicaid and you know, SSI and you know, what have food stamps. And they get all set up in the department, you're talking a 35 year old guy. And he's worked about, no, not, not so much a men in those days as if you get Medicaid, but you're talking to an adult and you get them set up in the department, and then what are you supposed to do? Yeah. You know, there's more to life than just sitting in your apartment. Yeah. And some of these people really do like to work, and there are not, they always didn't handle it at all. You know, we had the outpatient programs and stuff, almost none of which were ever concerned with more programs. We, we did have 
uh, one full-time person and three half-time person. They kind of worked in in, uh, in the jobs program for a while, and then during the recession, that was cut out. Because um, there were all kinds of programs, but there was very little two jobs. Yeah. And, and, and I think part of the reason that oftentimes lawmakers are reluctant to get mental health funding, to fund mental health, is because it's, it's always a one way street and it's always just money you don't have. Um, and it is, like you say, it's crime. You know, it, mental health is often people are going to need help for the rest of their lives. All the time. So I'm not saying always, but often. So you know, the lawmakers are over funding because this money just went out at all the time. Well, if they would help people along to get in the workplace, you know, I mean, it, it makes people feel better about themselves, and it's just like it's a whole area that's just totally ignored, and it just really frustrates. It's um, a really. You mentioned the. You, did you say the jobs program? They have them for a while. Yes. I don't know. Don't they have any more? Yeah, it's a did they get it back? Was they cut it during the recession? It just got kind of yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I think that the PAC might have someone, some core involved in, uh, you, know, you know, job placement. But it, it is kind of a short Because there's not, there's, for, for getting people back to work, you know, it's up to the and I can I see that one of your board members is is Chuck Duarte. And he 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 was around during that time, so I could ask him, Chuck, what was it that we had in place that was the work? But you're absolutely right, and that was a piece to the conversation that we didn't have a good answer to when we talk about wraparound services and in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, we we can get meds to them. We can try to work on a housing issue and try to work on stability, but there hasn't been a good answer to that next step, what you're talking about, which is the um, employment, in which I believe you, you shared with me at the door, which is you don't just want to sit around all day, you know, completely over-medicated. You want to, enough to be functional, and once you feel functional, you want to function and do something, and, and so. And it's the kind of job that when you, feel like you can work, work, and when you can't, it's okay to not work. And that, that's a big, I don't know what we can do on the legislative end yeah. to allow uh, payment or something for reimbursement for the employers who are willing to hire such people and yet uh, to have maybe two people for one job maybe, or somehow to... Yeah, there's been some discussion around using the model that exists um, with like high Sierra Industries yeah. um, for folks with, with the, the physical disabilities and, the, and more severe disabilities about how we could adjust that model for um, wraparound services for folks with mental health issues. They are exempt from minimum wage laws and so it's, it's not often very much, but it is a, an, an employment model where you are able to work when you can, do what you can, and when you can't, you, you right. don't. But At uh, one time they wanted to put both of those together, and it doesn't work for people with brain disorders. Yeah. You know, the environment is too noisy, it's too chaotic, mm -hmm. and what quite a few people with brain disorders need is stability, schedule, quiet. Yeah, and that was the distinction that, that there had to be um, the model would work, but the, it, there had to be a, a new physical space to do that that was exactly. a lot more quiet because I've been in there and it is, it's very, there's a lot, there lots of moving pieces in lots of different directions. Yeah. Speaking of employment, I have a job, if I can't work, it's okay. If I, if I need extra accommodations, it's okay. I've been working at Joanne Fabrics for 16 years. Yay to Joanne's fabrics! Yay! I mean, I disposed of my loss. I said, you know, I had a little bit of difficulty. And she was very kind to me. And I just know there is hope for people who have mental illnesses in the job market. There is hope. Yay. And we have to celebrate those employers who, who understand. We should, I gotta send Joanne. How can we make it more? Uh, 
That's a really good thing. Okay. Low wages, you still have to pay rent, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I actually have a bill in this session to move them towards paying the minimum wage and encourage that that segment of industry although they're exempt from paying the minimum wage to do more than just pay people three cents an hour um but the concept of just um they're right now a sheltered, sheltered work shop. site i had seven years in sheltered workshop it was a disaster <laughs> because they paid the uh, one penny one penny Right now, $10 and 12 cents exactly. We want to move them away from just paying one penny, or they they will literally have some people make three cents an hour, and exactly. mm -hmm. it it it's not exactly when we think about fairness and justice and employment for people. It it's not the bar that we set, but there it's going to be work. It's going to be work to figure out how we would go about setting it up so that um, so that there is. In, in employment friendly friendly environment um